Welcome to the fourth part of our Heritage Talk on the Berlin Airlift 10 Tons for Tempelhof, Life in the City. As I say, various things were moved in and out. Salt being one, newsprint being another, um, spies being another. I found in the record some interesting discussions on moving men and men and bullion, gold bullion, in and out of the city. So, you know, so it's quite interesting uh, you know, it's not all as cut and dried. It's not all food. Uh, no coal on board here. But what was interesting was uh, lots of refugee children and orphan children. Uh, if children had rela- uh, relatives who lived in the Western zones, they were encouraged, th- th- those families were encouraged to take children out of Berlin uh, and, and and look after them, which actually made sense, really, because it reduced the the, the mouths to feed, but it also reduced the amount of vulnerable people there. Um, orphans were interesting as well, because I've spoken to quite a number of um, chaps, most, and it was chaps mostly, in Ber- uh, in America, who were German in origin, who were uh, adopted by uh, American and occasionally British servicemen during this period, um, and moved to America or Britain. And have, and have lived out their lives in Britain. So it, it's fantastic, fantastic how far people did spree, spread from this particular situation. Also, sick children, as the film said, were taken out. Um, now, if you have a factory that's working in an area that's blockaded, it would be worthwhile having people work in it because you can keep a lot of people warm in one area. <clears throat> you only need power to that one place. Yeah people well we all know right at this moment that the the more contact we have with people the better you feel the less mental anguish there is and things like that so the Siemens uh, bulb electric light bulb factory was brought online as soon as it was physically possible in in the the western areas of Berlin and they produced the glass globes for the bulbs that were all we were all once familiar with as you probably were aware those were then uh, packed in cases cardboard cases and then loaded on these Sunderlands and then flown out of the area and then taken to the, the another Siemens factory where the electrical bits were fitted okay so all the uh, the, the, the the base and the cord and things like that but there was all sorts of complaints about this because that kit that was taken out there when it when these bulbs got to the, well when these glass globes got to the other end they were invariably all smashed and the problem was that the toilet on the aircraft was at the back of the aircraft and all the boxes were stacked in the middle of the aircraft um, and they wedged as many in as they could uh, and then the crew in the flight and what have you climbed over the boxes to go to the loo and any children that were on board constantly climbed over the boxes went to the toilet as, as is the want of children when they're excited or nervous um, and so so Siemens got rather upset that, you know, hang on a minute, we, we can only use one bulb out of a thousand here. But the, but the premise of it was not so much that they were taking stuff out, but that people thought in Berlin that they were doing a useful thing, that, that a useful activity, they were being productive, and also that there was all the social and mental help that was involved with working in a group and, and everything else. So, so we can start to drill down into some of these uh, some of the loads that are taken and, and and say a little bit more about why that was the case. Just as an aside and thinking about um, uh, just thinking about where we are with the uh, with, with post-war and some archaeology and how we spread these things, Aquila Airways. So Aquila Airways was one of the companies that set up um, on the south coast of Britain, buying in government surplus stock which was as it turned out these Sunderland aircraft and they used to, and they used them as um to, to fly tourists out to Madeira of all places and it was promoted as a uh, a legacy of the 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 flying boat experience from the 1930s of traveling around Africa and places like that um you know and they used um uh, they used these aircraft known as uh, short hides well, it is still a Sunderland, but it just doesn't have any machine guns on it or anything like that, which you'd be pleased to hear if you were going on a holiday, I think. And there is um, a short hide. You can see there's no uh, there's no machine guns on that at all. And it has a British registration, G-A, whatever that is. Um, this particular aircraft uh, flew in uh, 
quite quite a number of uh, things in was it 630 two sorties or no tons sorry in 118 sorties so that's quite good going now just before we go on to the civvies which is this particular one we should say that the airlift uh the, the waterborne aspects of the airlift finished in um in december 1948 uh they were the, the aircraft were useful for moving odd loads as we've said already but they weren't very efficient and by december that it, it was clear that the winter was not going to be as bad as it thought it was going to be uh, but it could turn nasty in february and march so more tonnage was needed to be pumped into the city uh the other problem with of course lake harvel and the the elbe where they were operating from in northern germany was that um they froze over and a, a flying boat does not work well on a frozen lake. Uh, so, so that was the part. That was the point where the uh, Sunderlands basically left the operation. So, Operation Plain Fair lost one of its more picturesque aspects. Um, and some of the servicemen that were involved lost some of their um, more favourite picking grounds because all the nurses and young ladies used to go and watch the aircraft come and land. On Lake Harville. So, where was the best place to go and um, share your uh, re your ration cigarettes and things like that, and maybe uh, go for a drink afterwards? So, yeah. So that so that was that that was the demise of the Sunderlands. Anyway, now 1948. You would think there'd be still lots of aircraft around from the Second World War. Well, we couldn't be much further from the truth. There was aircraft around, but most of them were unserviceable. Um, Vast swathes of them were stood in breakers yards, um, ready to be recycled. Um, and so the, the, there was no real possible way of generating them. But at the end of the war, some uh, some enterprising pilots and crews had decided they were going to buy their aircraft or buy some aircraft of the type they were familiar with um, and operate them as postal services and freight and cargo and this, that and the other to fly around Europe. Um, lots of entrepreneurs set up this way. Uh, aided, interestingly, by a chap called Freddie Laker, of which some of you might be quite familiar, um, in the 1970s, the first king of low-cost airlines with uh, with Laker Airways. Um, anyway, so aircraft were available to buy, but aircraft were also starting to be remanufactured again. So what we've got here is, on the top right, we've got a Tudor, and that's an Avro Tudor, which is which is built by Avro specifically for the civil market. And then in the bottom left, we've got uh, a Lancastrian. I think it's a Lancastrian, yeah, um, which is a Lancaster, basically. Uh, derivative, it is, yeah, um, which is a civil converted version. So you can see there's two different ways now, different aircraft that people are operating. So civilian operators then operated a ragtag and interesting collection of these aircraft. This is an Avro York. Um, now you might be able to see the Lancasters stood there if you ignore the fuselage. The wing section and the tail are Lancaster, but the fuselage is quite substantially bigger at the front end, meaning that the aircraft could yaw around a lot. So that's why there's a third fin in the middle. Now um, I spoke that, that. So this is a Lancaster derivative, basically, uh, with a new fuselage. Now these were used to carry coal up to ten ten eight to 10 tons of coal uh, with um, in sacks. Now, to get to, to operate them, uh, to operate these at maximum efficiency, what would happen is that the load would be filled. So you'd have up to 10 tons of coal on board and then the wing tanks would be filled to the brim with fuel, effectively producing a flying bomb that could burn for a week. So what they so the reasons for that were twofold. One, we needed to get as much coal on in, but also fuel was needed in Berlin. So the aircraft would take off at a maximum all up weight from the western area, fly into Gatow, land. It would have used enough fuel to make a landing safe, still a bit hazardous, still a bit heavy, but but safe. Crews would uh, ground crews would descend on it and race to empty the thing as quickly as it was physically possible of coal onto and there was races and 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 tunner was clever he 
he pitted one crew against another there was tallies for each airfield tallies for each crew you know there was there was bottles of beer involved with it which also always motivates fellas you know things like that so so, so he built it a race and a challenge into this so they cleared the coal out of the aircraft and then the aircraft was defueled they pumped out as much fuel as they could out of the uh, wing tanks so there was just enough fuel left in it for it to take off from Gatow and get back to the, the the station in the west well as you can imagine there's problems with that so next please Maddie and it should show the crash so bottom left we've got the same aircraft when it came to grief on the way into Gatow. Um, because of its all at weight, when it uh, when it landed, when it was coming into land, um, it was just too heavy to stay in the sky. The, the, the pilot, the thing, probably got the airspeed slightly wrong and the aircraft stalled at the end of the runway and crashed uh, the, and the crew were killed. 45 uh, crew and ground crew were killed during this operation. Not all through air crashes, um, as you can probably see with the picture of the York there, it has a tail wheel, which means it's very difficult to see out of the windows when you're taxiing along. All right, and that's if you've ever seen any photographs or film of the Lancasters taxiing on a, a, an RAF station before the bombing raid, they weave from left to right. And they're weaving from left to right so that the pilot or co-pilot can see out the window and see what's in front of them. Well, unfortunately, one of these taxied up the back of a truck that only had a canvas back on it that was full of uh, full of German uh, unloading crew and killed nine of them as the propeller basically went right up the truck. So, so there was some real nasty accidents involved with this. But as you can see, this particular aircraft crashed with the loss of the crew. What is interesting is the fact that you can also see uh, German uh, German crews picking up all the coal. With, you see the bags there and what have you. So even though the aircraft had been lost, there was still an opportunity to get some coal out of this. And so uh, and and so it was still cleaned of of of, uh, of the cargo uh, to get that into the system in Berlin. So if we look back at the city, we've already experienced uh, the, the fact there's no power and such like. Uh, People though, many of the buildings that were that had been damaged in the war were still in a in a in a state of disrepair. And you may see in the bottom left there, I think it is, there's people living in cellars. Uh, you maybe see the uh, the chimneys coming out of the cellars, if that's the right picture. I think it probably is. Yeah. Um, and in the top right, of course, we've got Black Market. Black Market was always his favourite. If you could get um, if you could get coffee. That was a valuable commodity, as was cigarettes, as you would imagine. Um, talking to some of the uh, ground crew that worked at um, uh, RAF Abingdon near Oxfordshire, they serviced these air, the York aircraft when they came in, having done 200 flying hours every so often. And a car, an aircraft like a car, every so often you need to check some things on it. So they do it in flying hours. And every 200 hours, the York flew back to the UK and was was given a primary service at, uh, at, um, at Abingdon. Um, and what was interesting was on that flight, that is where all the Leica cameras and things like that were stashed on board uh, from the city and flown in uh, to various people who were waiting for them at, at, um, at, at Abingdon, who would then flog them. Um, and then they were put back on board, loads of tins of coffee and cigarettes and all sorts of things like that. Now. In theory, customs and excise uh, were interested in such activities, but in fact, it didn't really matter. People didn't worry too much about it. So yeah, so so there was a, so there was even contacts in the black market spreading across Europe, a bit like a mafia, if you like, with people supplying um, supplying their comrades at the other end with 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 more easily transferable goods, should we say? Uh, Watches as well were an interesting thing that came into Abingdon quite regularly, I believe. Because the housing situation was so bad, people were still living in, in obviously temporary accommodation. Here we are in some extreme uh, 14 foot Nissen huts. Uh, these are two stills from a film that was that was shot by uh, the Virgin in BBC at the time. Um, on conditions in Germany and certainly in Berlin. And here we are with um, 
as you can see there's the outside of the huts and and there's the inside yeah very personal uh, no private space whatsoever uh, and and at the time of the lift there was no way that you could build up that that housing stock in the city to make it livable so so these conditions prevailed up into the 50s in some instances um one thing that you do need to get, get a city running of course is the trolleys or the, the the underground and various other aspects and i just think this is a nice nice picture in a number of ways you can see the beaten up state of the tram um but you see the uh rather enthusiastically looking young lady there posing for the camera and just to give you an idea as to uh the fact that whilst um whilst it may have been a, a miserable time people did try to actually um get back to some form of normality and fashion is one of those things it's not a very good fashion look i must say uh typical uniform uh, but look at her shoes you'll see this young lady's made her own shoes yeah, so shoes were not, clearly not an essential to fly in, but shoes were obviously a, an essential, and they're quite snazzy at the end of the day. Um, so people were, uh, you know, were were not relying completely on the Allies, certainly not for shoes anyway. As the film said, as time goes on, milestones were made. Uh, here, here we have a milestone. You see on the tr truck front how how much that was. Uh, this is a C. This is a C-54 aircraft, so it's a, a an American aircraft, and and that's that's a rec, a record for that day being offered. If we go to the next one, we've got a Hastings aircraft. This is a, a chap called John who lives down in Bristol, who's still around, who, who allowed me to look through his archive, which was fantastic. The Hastings uh, was a tail dragon aircraft, and it was a brand new aircraft for the Royal Air Force. So they put their brand new aircraft straight onto this onto the lift where they humped bags of coal curl about in them for the next year and a half, bashed in them to bits. Now the Hastings carried on as a transport aircraft in the Air Force till the early 1960s. And whenever they went in for servicing, didn't matter what time it was, whenever you jacked the aircraft up and took it off its wheels and moved anything piles of coal dust would fall out of the thing onto the hangar floor so there was <laughs> so there was a reminder in these aircraft of what they've been carrying for decades afterwards by february the millionth ton had been flown into the city this is at uh, this this is at gatow now the a point that the point to remind you of here and that million tons has come in in loads of 3 or eight to nine tons, maybe 10 if you're lucky. So that tells you how many flights there'd been be between uh, between the end of June 1948 and the end of February or the middle of February as this is, uh, 19, uh, 1949. That's half a ton of supplies for every Berliner that stayed on the Western side. When you put it into figures, that includes coal, bread, salt, uh, very newspapers, all sorts of things, keeping them alive and keeping them going. So that is an incredible amount of tonnage. Thank you for watching part four of this Heritage Talk on the Berlin Airlift 10 tons for Tempelhof.